So I am male, grey hair, unshaven, slightly scruffy, wearing a green t-shirt today. Um, and I'm accompanied by my uh, normal crew, two Labradors, uh, a yellow one called Bali and a black one called Bess, who attend all my presentations and conference calls. So thank you very much for having the opportunity to talk about the Immersive Accessibility Project today. Um, I introduced myself earlier, um, but I just wanted to say hello again. So I'm Chris, Chris Hughes, um, a lecturer from Salford University. Uh, and I tend to describe myself as a technologist. Um, a lot of the people here are either um, engineers or uh, different, but I tend to think more as a technologist because I like to hack things together. I'm, I'm much more of those kind of problem solvers. I'm not a good software guy. I'm not good at building things. But I tend to have really good ideas and I'm quite good at hacking them together to show them off and then handing them to someone that actually knows how to implement them, implement them properly. Um, interestingly, just because I think it's funny, um, I'm actually supposed to also be teaching a, a workshop at Salford University at the moment. So um, say hello to um, my alter ego who is currently looking after my workshop at Salford um, and answering questions there at the moment while I'm taking a few minutes out to be here today to talk to you. So. Hopefully no one from Salford will realise that actually uh, the Labradors are currently answering those questions while I go along. So what I'm really here for is to talk to you for a few minutes about the Immersive Accessibility Project. Um, this is a project that finished this summer um, and it was an absolute privilege to be part of it. It was the first kind of big uh, collaborative project that I was involved in um, as an early career researcher. Um, and so I have a lot of fond memories and I, I'm very pleased with some of the results that we achieved. I think it was a great project. Um, in essence, it was a European project funded by Horizon 2020, um, which was great because it gave us a big pot of money um, to run over three years and, and bring in a lot of partners and do some really exciting things. Um, and the overall aim of the project was in essence to look at how we could effectively integrate accessibility within immersive media. So what I mean by this, I mean uh, immersive video, 360 degree video, whether that's on a head mounted display or whether that's using a tablet to immerse yourself in the media. How do you then bring in and integrate accessibility services such as subtitling, audio description, sign language? Um, and interestingly, it turns out to be a much more interesting problem. Um, most of the things that have been done previously were basically about lifting what exists on traditional television. So on a traditional television, you have two lines of text, 30 characters wide. And most of the time when we looked at um, 360 degree video, where you obviously can look around, most of what had already been done was to lift the same kind of approach into the immersive um, environment. Um, and so the project was basically looking at how you could then personalize those services in order to meet the needs of people within that environment, but also taking into account all the kind of extra opportunities you have within that environment. Um, the project followed a user centric methodology, um, which was all about keeping users at the center. It was about building something for the users, with the users, and then providing it for them at the end of the day. Um, and so it gave us a kind of three main step approach um, where we started at the beginning uh, gathering requirements. Um, there was a section in the middle where we were focused on the development and integration, which is where, um, as a technologist, I fitted into the project mainly. Um, and then at the end, we also talked a lot about validation how we could disseminate those results and get them out there and give them out to people to actually make a difference. Um, and it has to be said, um, again, I call myself an early career researcher. Um, I learned a lot from this project um, simply in terms of I had my own expectations going in. I knew what I wanted to build. I had no idea what the users actually wanted. Um, and in the end of the day, we ended up building something that was somewhere in the middle. Um, and with a lot of these things you'll learn when you get into research and you get into projects, you'll find quite often the outcome isn't what you expect or there are limitations that don't get you to where you want to go. Um, and for those of you that are attending my workshop on Wednesday, I'll actually be talking a bit more about where I felt this project fell a little short. And so, although it did push the boundaries a long way, what we could actually do next. 
So in terms of a project, um, this is a very wordy slide, I'm afraid, but it was all about building requirements, integrating accessibility services, how to actually manage it, how to bring in personalization, um, what could we reuse from what was already existed? There were a lot of questions at the beginning of this project. Um, and also things like which presentation modes work best? What's a comfortable way of using it? How do you make it safe? How do you build a user interface? How do you interact with uh, and make it interactive for users to use? Again, throughout the project, the focus was on working with um, people that needed the accessibility services. And so maybe traditional user interfaces don't uh, work in the same way, particularly, for example, when maybe you're wearing a head mounted display, suddenly the rest of the world is cut off from you. You've no longer got access to your keyboard and mouse. How do you start to make these things work? So the project built an end to end platform. Um, it was focused on everything. It wasn't just focused on how do you understand the users and build a player for them um, because um, access services within 360 degree video was a relatively new concept. There weren't production tools. There weren't tools out there to edit the content, to produce the videos, or even to distribute it. Um, so as part of this uh, project, we had to build all the content production tools. We had to uh, integrate with uh, broadcasters to develop the service uh, provision um, and distribution. And we also, at the end of the day, had to build the player that would consume that and make it available to people. So this is um, a bit of a high level diagram of what we ended up building. Um, the idea was that we would have broadcasters involved. We had technologists and academics involved. Um, and the broadcasters always wanted to keep the content in house on their own systems. Um, and so we had to build platforms with things like an accessibility content manager where they could produce that information um, and they could push it up onto the iMac platform um, ready to play out and those kind of things. And the idea of the project as well was to be completely kind of device agnostic. Um, our player had to support connected televisions. It had to support um, web based players, had to support head mounted displays, mobile devices. The idea was we could take content and we could render it wherever it was appropriate to people to use it and make the accessibility services work. Um, so as I say, as part of that, we had to build editing tools. Um, one of the partners in the project, Angler Technic, um, did a fantastic job of building um, a cloud-based platform that had an accessibility content manager. You could upload your 360 degree video. You could edit that content there. You could add uh, subtitles, but with the subtle difference that none of the existing kind of subtitle um, editors allowed you to give positions. And so for this project, we needed to know things like the position of the subtitles within the 360 degree space and actually be able to position them as well. Uh, and the same with sign language and audio description. All the tools were provided to do it. Um, and if you've been involved in um, accessibility and generating things like subtitles before, um, the tools that we built looked very similar. Um, and this was through design. The tools were designed so that they had a similar feel to what already existed for a subtitle editor to work with, um, except in this case, you had the opportunity to add things like um, the position that the subtitle appeared. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and it also allowed you to import existing subtitles from other formats and convert them and things like that. So as well as the end to end platform, the key thing we had to build was the iMac player, and this is probably the most interesting to most people. Um, it was effectively a web based video player. Um, it's a really interesting decision to make. Um, and we made early on in the project that we wanted to build something that was web based rather than an application based. This means in essence to access the player, you simply need to type in a URL onto a web browser whether that's on a head mounted display or your mobile device or your laptop, rather than downloading and installing or going to an app store and downloading something. So it's a really important decision made early on that we were going to build something that was web based and it made it incredibly quick and easy to distribute, particularly while you're doing testing and evaluation and those kind of things. <coughs> so the player um, had to support things like 
traditional media, um, as well as um, equirectangular uh, 360 degree video projections. Um, but it, the idea was that we could then overlay into there some of the accessibility services that we needed. Um, and these, as I say, were the sign language, audio description, um, text-based subtitles, audio subtitles. All of these things had to be available and turn up, uh, be able to uh, be enabled, um, and they had to work together as well. So there were a lot of complexities in how do you actually lay out the screen if you've got subtitles and a signer in screen and you're wearing a head-mounted display. Actually, you don't have that much screen real estate to play with. You have to do some quite neat things with maybe re-blocking the subtitles and things like that. Um, so a lot of the project also focused on the user interface. How could you interact with it? Um, and obviously, a lot of the users that want these access services are also low-sighted users, for example. So we had both a traditional and a low-sighted menu. Um, we focused on integrating with uh, other standards, such as um, universal icons that people recognize for the different access services. Um, and we also integrated where we could with other existing assistive technology. Um, so, for example, I mentioned before, one of the issues you do tend to come across in this world is once you put a head-mounted display on someone, suddenly, regardless of uh, their usual interface, they've lost access to a keyboard or a mouse or even interaction with other people in the room. Um, and so a lot of the project focused on looking at things like, could we integrate voice recognition? Um, and so we basically built a remote plugin that allowed you to use things like Amazon Alexa to actually start the player, pause the player, um, and change the personalization options. Um, and that, again, massively simplified the menus because you didn't have to find the menu in the space. You could simply talk to the system, and it would change things for you. Um, and obviously, um, with every kind of large project, we had to integrate with existing standards, technologies. Um, and so we looked at using uh, adaptive streaming um, for delivering the video. Um, and we also focused on being able to, to deliver to things like HBB TV. Um, so this is a little bit what the player looks like. Um, I will, again, those of you that come to the workshop on Wednesday, you'll see more examples of the iMac player because I'll use it as a kind of example of a research platform. Um, but our player, it had a, uh, a very traditional user interface, but we also had a low sighted interface, which made the menu, if you needed it, as large as possible so that you could clearly identify the different kind of uh, options within the menu. Um, we also had things like the universal accessible icons. Um, and we brought in other ideas to try to guide people around, um, such as if you're in an immersive environment, all of a sudden the person speaking could be stood behind you. If you can't hear the audio um, because you're using subtitles, you can't tell where the action's happening. And so we had to bring in other ideas, such as putting arrows on the subtitles and, and the radar, and, which gave you a kind of a spatial awareness of where you were and what was happening around you. So I've no idea how long I spoke for, um, but hopefully that was about the right time. As I say, um, <coughs> oh, excuse me, um, those of you that come to the workshop on Wednesday, I do start by talking a bit about the iMac player and the platform and the project and how we got there in terms of the research because I like to use that as an interesting platform to talk about how future work came out of it and deliver some of my experiences um, as someone looking in as to how that might be useful um, and the lessons learned, really. <laughs>